I don't believe in the daily horoscopes, you know. I mean, I, I always look at them and I'm like, that didn't happen today. Or, you know, like, it's like I don't believe in that stuff. But I do believe that our characteristics, I, I think they're kind of spot on for astrology. Um, I'm a Gemini with a Leo rising and a Scorpio moon, which makes it like extremely complicated for me. Um, but I'll ask everybody before they get in the room, you know, if you're a Capricorn, you gotta go. <laughs> I'm Barb Morrison, and we are out at my house in Frenchtown, New Jersey. Here's the house, it's from 1739. Um, we're out on the Delaware River, and I'm going to show you my junk. I'm non-binary, so don't ever ask a trans person to show you their junk, but I will show you some junk today. My wife and I think we do have some past life stuff here going on, but I spoke to a historian and a past life regressionist about the house. And the historian said that the way the house is built, the room that is my studio would have historically been the room that all the births took place in. So a lot of births from 1739, you know, up through the time. So it's definitely like a little bit of a portal in there. Um, and the past life regressionist that I spoke to said, it's important that we have music in there because that keeps the energy flowing if it is a portal. So whether or not you believe that, I mean, the truth of the matter is, is that it's from 1739 and that's where everybody was born. So, and the, also the past life regressionist said, um, kind of think about all the, uh, the, the, the music and the concerts that happened on this porch, which could be amazing. Okay, come on into my home. So this 1739 style would be considered the hearth. This is where they would have cooked. Um, this is built so, you know, back then they didn't have electricity, but if you put your hand inside there in the summer, it's actually cold. They knew what they were doing with the architecture back then. Um, and then we have, this is, you know, we eat here, whatever. Um, I have my Spencer tunics. I was in the famous um, Spencer tunic Times Square shoot there. And that was back, let's see, that was in the 90s. So it was like, Times Square was still like kind of gritty back then. And when Spencer went up on the, on the ladder to shoot us, like everybody has to be really quiet. It's like dead silent. It's like five o'clock in the morning or six o'clock in the morning, dead silent. And I, I look over and there's a drunk guy waking up and the first thing he sees is this. He was like, what the hell kind of a bender was I on? Uh, this table was from a place called David's Potbelly in New York City. It was a place we all used to go to like after the clubs. It was open till like six in the morning. So it's got some real cool history to it. Lots of cool carvings and stuff. We used to eat there all the time. Both my brothers were um, into music but they weren't like super musicians. Like one of my brothers was uh, a drummer and then the other one was a DJ, but they weren't like super professional about it or anything. And it was the seventies. So in the seventies, there was like a big like rock versus disco war. And um, so you were either rock or disco, you weren't like both. And one of my brothers was rock and one of my brothers was disco. So I was like their little guinea pig about it. So they'd be like pulling me each way, you know, like listen to this, listen to this. And it would be like rock, disco, rock, disco. I melted the two kind of things together also with a lot of other influences. But once punk happened, that was mine. That wasn't theirs. So punk sounded like nothing else at all, right? And at the same time punk happened, sonically there were a bunch of like, like the cars happened and like Elvis Costello happened and sonically those sounded completely different than Led Zeppelin. Everybody was listening to Led Zeppelin, right? 
So I remember hearing that car stuff coming out of like somebody's car stereo and just being like, that sounds really cool and different. How was that made? You know, how, how does that, why does it sound different? So my brothers would always give me this extra equipment that they had. So I had, I started off with a DJ mixer and two cassette decks. And I would, you know, sing something into one cassette and then I'd run that back through and I'd sing a harmony over the other side and then you have to like switch them. And the whole thing just comes out sounding like with a bunch of hiss, it's horrible. But I realized as that, like as I was building the tracks, I was like, oh, I see. And um, so then I moved up to this thing called a Faust X, X, X15, I think it's called, it's a, um, a four track. And that was four channels with the cassette deck and so i mean the possibilities were endless there it was like sergeant pepper was made on a four track you know and at the time now new wave was exploding so like i had heard that the eurythmics made a record on eight track and i was like ooh, if i only had eight tracks like you know my my small brain was just like expanding and uh so i just you know immediately was obsessed with how can we make bigger recordings? And I started, you know, I did what all teenagers do. I smoked pot and listened to Dark Side of the Moon. And I just became obsessed with how to build sonic skyscrapers, really, you know? I moved to New York at the age of 17. And so I got in this band called Gutter Boy. They were giving out a lot of record deals in the late 80s, early 90s. And we got signed to Elektra. We got signed like as the biggest signing for a new band in the history of Elektra Records. And that record never even came out. We just blew through the whole budget, you know, just blew it on instruments and like partying and like making demos. And then again, because they were giving out a lot of deals back then, we jumped right over to Geffen Records and we got like a similar deal. Um, that record came out. Uh, I wasn't fully a member of the band yet, so I didn't get a member of Gutter Boy until we, I think we jumped over to Mercury Records after that. In between, I like had my own deal on RCA, I had a solo deal. But Mercury Records is really where it kind of took off for us. We were like, you know, we went on tour with the Stray Cats, we opened for Jesus and Mary Chain, we played a bunch of shows with the Ramones. You know, it was fun. We were young and wild and free in New York City. One, two, one, two, This is uh, my old band. We were shot by Allen Ginsberg. Those are all like his signed photos. That's us nude in Allen Ginsberg's bed. That's us at his kitchen table, fire escape, roof. That's pretty cool. Um, we got my hardware over here, which I will tell you a little bit about later, but you know, it's kind of impossible in this day and age to get even a gold record, so I feel like I lucked out on that. Um, come on in here, got some great art from people. This is from All the Pretty Horses, Venus de Mars. Put that, this great trans artist. Uh, careful in here. So this is where we record our vocals mostly, and it's got a nice tight kind of like, you know, cool living room vibe and the sound. And um, we do most of it in this room. Um, I got the autograph Joni Mitchells there. Okay, you guys, let's go into the studio. That's Jeremy, Kinney, that's Gina Volpe, Hi. and we're making a record today. I lay in bed last night and fell behind my eyes. My body still bones dry. First and foremost, before I even go into the studio with artists, I try to like ask them, you know, what's this record about? What's this song about? Um, what are you really trying to say? You know, and I feel like that's the difference between a producer and an engineer. You know, an engineer is like full of technical stuff. 
knows how to do a bunch of stuff that I really don't know how to do. I'm not that interested in the technical stuff, but I want to, I can say to the engineer, I want this to sound a little sorrowful, but still triumphant. And the engineer's like, I know what to do, you know? And so the, the engineer can do the technical stuff, but I'm bringing more of the emotion and the story. Um, so to me, that's the difference between an engineer and a producer. Um, also, you know, if you're looking at the back of your producer's head for the whole session, he's an engineer. The person who is trying to translate the story to the technical person, you know, has got to be not the back of their head, got to be turned around and facing the artist and really getting into the artist and bringing this out, bringing all this stuff out the right way, you know? And there's all these nuances. I mean, a singer, a singer can focus, you know, poorly on one little syllable. They can say like, I didn't like the way I said the ing and breathing. And I know that may be belly button gazing, but it's like, you know, you, you want to make sure that the artist gives the exact emotion that they want and you pull, you know how to pull it out of them. So I think that's a, that's a big difference between producing and engineering for sure. Over here we have Jeff Emmerich, autograph Jeff Emmerich. And if you don't know who Jeff Emmerich is, you should Google him because I know I probably should be saying, George Martin, George Martin, right? I'm a producer. He made the Beatles sound like incredible. Um, I always say a producer is only as good as their engineer. This guy was the engineer on all the cool Beatles stuff. He was the one that invented that backwards loop in, um, Turn off your mind, relax, and float downstream. That was this dude. I definitely was a collector of a lot of stuff, but once I had to pare down, it's like, okay, so what's essential, you know? And what is versatile enough to stay? If we need something crazy, like a couple weeks ago, like Jeremy recorded me playing the oven with brushes. You know, so it's like, I don't need to have like some weird thing to do that. Like it's already in the kitchen. We just walk in and he records it and I play a little thing. Or, you know, I mean, I've played, actually played the house a bunch of times. Like I played a beat on the house inside because there's like different tones throughout the rooms. So I, I love taking like whatever is just at my fingertips and just making something cool out of that. You know, pots and pans, glasses. So we do a lot of that stuff, you know. Um, and that's not, that's not like a unique trick. I mean, they played a chair on Fleetwood Mac Rumors. That's not like anything that's like, I didn't invent it, you know? But it's really cool and it always comes out, it just comes out nice. It's always like a nice, unique little flavor, you know, in the headphones. Contrary to many people's love for monitors, I prefer NS10s. And I was lucky enough to be gifted the original NS10s from Green Street Studios. So the things that have been recorded through these two speakers, uh, the most famous is Fight the Power, was recorded at Green Street. Uh, That's the Breaks by Curtis Blow, which is a, it's like a classic hip hop song. Um, I mean, all kinds of stuff, Shaka Khan, James Brown, Sonic Youth, um, the whole wave of hip hop that was like Tribe Called Quest, De La Soul, all that stuff was done through this. And my personal favorite that actually came through these cones was um, Let the music play, he won't get away. You guys know that song? It's like a freestyle song. It's by Shannon. So that came through these cones. So that, that's, these are like really, really historical. Uh, Jeremy doesn't love me to make him work on the Oratones, but I like to do it because it doesn't fatigue my ears. But, and then when you go down to the NS10s, it sounds like there's a woofer. I have this. This is the Strat that my parents bought me when I was 14. It was the only instrument other than my saxophone that they ever bought me. Um, it lived through many ups and downs, like when I lived in a crack house in the 80s, I would sleep with it. Um, I tried to sell it at Chelsea Guitars in New York City, and I owe this guy my life because I brought it in. I was probably gonna sell it for something horrible. And I brought it in, and the guy at Chelsea Guitars goes, you don't wanna, you don't wanna sell this guitar. I go, why? He goes, what are you gonna do? You're gonna get like a couple hundred dollars? He was like, this is a really great guitar. So decades later, I still own it. 
The guy refused to buy it from me because he's a good guy. I saw him actually out at a restaurant a little while ago and I told him the story and he was like, that's, he was like, that's really nice. Yeah, I don't know if you remember. Uh, it's my 83 um, P bass that I got when I was a teen in New York City. Um, I think my boss at a Mexican restaurant bought me that because I told him I wanted to play bass. Okay, so over here, so I don't really like collect a lot of gear, but I think between these two amps, we can kind of get it going. This is from, it was an old department store called Grant's. It was like one, it was like one quality below Sears, Grant's was. And this is from 1969. We're gonna plug Gina into it in a little while. It's gonna fucking blow your head off. And then just for clean stuff, we got the champ. Otherwise, if we gotta do other amps, you know, we'll either do them in the box or we'll go to New York City. Um, this is the Guild guitar that I believe Mercury Records bought me in a deal. It's beautiful. It just, it like records really nice. This is Jeff Lee Johnson's Strat. If you know who he is, he's a jazz guitarist. He played with Esperanza Spalding and um, George Duke. And it's just got a ton of vibe to it. And I, I get a lot of my cool stuff from this place called D-Town Guitars, which is down the river. And that guy just has so many cool things. He's a collector. If you really want to see some show us your junk, go down there. He's got great, great stuff. And uh, he hooked me up with this. And we're also working with Gina's SG. My Her classic it's, SG. It's, it's actually, it's an arch top Diablo. These, uh, because I always wanted a uh, Les Paul SG hybrid, but they don't exist. Um, so this is as close as I can get. So it's my arch top SG. Nice. I have another really cool SG I'm going to show you guys out here. So this also came from Rob at D-Town. And this is, it says New York Dolls, written. Sylvain, actually, he was the one that autographed it. And we got Sylvain's, that's Sylvain's SG. And... I can't read this, but it says, oh wait, maybe I can. I, Sylvain Mizrahi, AKA Sylvain Sylvain of the New York Dolls, bought this Gibson SG serial number, whatever. And then he just goes on to talk about like how he played it with Alice Cooper. He played it with the Dead Boys. He played it with the Dolls. And then he notarized it, so. And I don't know if you guys saw Pistol, that show Pistol on Hulu, but like Steve Jones kind of, you know, it's about Steve Jones' story with the Sex Pistols and, um, there's a moment when Malcolm McLaren puts Sylvain's guitar on Steve Jones and he says, I crown you Excalibur. So he's kind of saying like Sylvain's guitar like started punk. This isn't the one, but this is like an, a later one. But yeah, this is Sylvain's guitar. So we're gonna be using a bunch of like cool, you know, New York Dolls stuff in here today on Gina's stuff, but that's awesome. What do you think is going to be the most like craziest thing? Gina already has the Astral Destiny. Um, that Afterneath maybe might be kind of cool. But I'm going to play out here, right, Jeremy? Yeah, dude, this is going to be sick. I don't really fancy myself a sax player. I fuck with it, but I don't really... I wouldn't say I'm a sax player in front of like a real saxophonist, you know, by any means. But I can get some stuff out of it. Yeah. I love it enough to have it tattooed on me at least. Oh. So. I was in like band band when I was a little kid. I was, I wanted to be, when the, they passed the little paper around that you write, you know, what instrument you want to play. The school had to call my mom and dad and be like, um, Barb wrote tuba on the thing that they wanted to play, but like the tuba actually like weighs more than Barb. And so that was a sad day for me. And so they were like, how about saxophone? So I reluctantly played saxophone and it turned out like the right decision because I think as I moved to New York City, I probably wouldn't have gotten like any rock and roll sousaphone gigs. I just started getting in bands, like in New York City. It was the 80s. Um, 
there was still a really cool like Lower East Side Alphabet City no wave scene happening. There was CBGB's had a Sunday hardcore matinee. So that was all the punk rockers came out on Sunday because it was all underage, right? We were all like, you know, 17, 16. So that was all, you know, we saw the Bad Brains, we saw, you know, we saw Agnostic Front. We, we saw everybody. I saw the, one of the first Sonic Youth con shows at CB's. Um, it was just a great, great time in New York City music. I mean, it was really fun. And so all that kind of just developed and by the time I was 19, I was playing on stage with the New York Dolls in one of their reunions. So I was on stage with Johnny Thunders like as a teenager. And we were opening for the Ramones, all, you know, the whole, the whole New York City punk scene. And Debbie Harry and Blondie were happening at the time, but I didn't really meet her till like, um, I mean, I would say hi to her in passing, um, but I would say hi to everybody in passing. It was New York City, like I would, you know, the Clash was hanging out. It was like, you know, everybody was there. But I didn't really meet her till like late 90s, like early 2000s. We have this Casio synth, and I'll plug it in in a little while. Um, but how I got this was um, I needed a bed. I had this really, really crummy mattress, and I was at Debbie Harry's house, and I was like, I really need to go buy a new mattress. And she goes, Oh, I have a brand new mattress in the wrapper in my garage. If you want to help me like move some stuff out, you can just have it. I go, oh, cool, awesome. So we go into her garage and we're like moving all this stuff out. It's like way in the back, the mattress. And we finally get to the mattress and we pull it out. And as we're pulling it out, this comes crashing down on the ground. And I'm like, Deb, what the hell is this? And she goes, Oh, it's some synthesizer. We used it on some of the Blondie records. And I was like, really? And she goes, yeah, it's from the 80s. Do you want it? And I'm like, like it should be in like a museum, right? So then as I'm pulling this out, like four of her platinum records fall out. And I go, and, and one of them cracked, the, the, the glass cracked. I go, Deb, you, <laughs> don't you care about your gold and platinum records? She was like, oh. I mean, I guess, I go, I would care if I had one. She goes, well, the record we made probably went gold. I go, it did? It was my first one. I had never had a gold record. She was like, yeah? And I'm like, uh, I didn't know that. And she goes, I'll get one for you. Don't worry. So then I got my, that's how I got my first gold record was I broke one of Debbie Harry's platinum records. And she was like, oh, I'll just give you the one that you are owed. So this, you know, when I asked her about like busting it out, because I haven't actually played in it a little bit, she was like, oh yeah, it's such kind of like a lo-fi piece of gear. She was like, I hope it still works. It does, it does work, but it only does like four things. Yeah, just roll it. I'm going to do that little, uh, that little bass line there. This is very Devo, right? My fave. Got enough for that, right? Did I do the line right? What? I do, 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 do. Yeah, I did it. Yeah. Jeremy, are you going afterneath? What are you doing? Yeah, I think we're going to do afterneath. 
Okay. You want to see it cool. These days, as things move more in the box, it's nice to be able to like get our hands on something. You know, we, we tend to do these sessions where we're just using a lot of plugins and a lot of fake amps and synthesizers. And I know for me and Barb, our work is really important to like put our hands on something. And we find that pedals tend to be the easiest thing for us to do that with. We can get you know really in the more in the music with you know with the knobs and really be able to craft a sound that we love that we can't get when our brains are looking at a screen. And we just you know. For us, it's crucial to have so many different textures and pedal and so many different, different sonic colors we can get out of the music with our hands and you know, kind of like the old school way. That's cool. Jeremy, why do you like that pedal? I like it because it gives you this sort of odd reverb. It's not just like a typical tell. It's got like this, it's like almost like you're in this like clown room or like there's mirrors <laughs> or something. And it's got this like strange slap thing happening. And I find that like the more that I use reverb, the more I'm interested in like how do we fuck up the reverb or how do we make the reverb interesting? Like they always talk about like the order of pedals. Like you gotta go drive, this, that, end with the reverb. What if we put the drive after the reverb? And just like make the, re you know, rooms don't sound beautiful. They sometimes sound crazy or sometimes sound chaotic. So I find that I like more reverbs with character or yeah. that like to have some like story to tell beyond just like beautiful space. Sick. I know you never see in a plug down men menu like House of Mirrors. Why not? Right. <laughs> you like, like long you know, hall, a, right. uh, choir hall, but never House of Mirrors. Right. I want House of Mirrors. I want, House yeah. of Mirrors. <laughs> I want that crazy reverb. The clowns jumping out. <laughs> Where's the clown reverb? <laughs> clown reverb. So being out here, we're on 34 acres of land, um, so it's much different than you know being in the concrete jungle. But um, being in the studio and just being like full on, you do need the opposite, right? So you got to come outside for a little bit and take an ear break, and you know have a cup of coffee and listen to the birds and stare off. And I just don't think like. I don't always get that in New York City. I love the studios I work in in New York City, but we don't have that. And that really makes it so that you get to come back in, you take a breath, and then you can get back to work. So it's really nice being out here. Um, I have a few artists that like won't work anywhere else now. They'll only work here with us. And I'm just like, mm, I can get you a couple days in New York City. And they're like, nah, we're coming to Frenchtown. <laughs>